Hello, I'm Charlotte Leesman, and today we're talking about terror versus horror, and when you would want to use one versus the other. To get us started today, one thing that I really enjoy doing is reading the reviews that people leave online for books that they've read. And a while ago, I was reading a book review, and I don't even remember which book it was, and but it was gothic, and the reader said that she was terribly disappointed because she reads horror all the time and the book just really wasn't very scary. And what occurred to me was that there is a huge misconception about the role of fear in Gothic literature. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about terror versus horror. What are the differences? Why you would want to use one versus the other? What is more traditionally used in Gothic literature? And how we can really understand those two things. So to start off, let's talk about the definitions of terror and horror. So a terror is basically like an unseen dread or like a sense of foreboding about some latent fear or something that is within oneself or an association from our past that perhaps leaves us feeling very unsettled and anxious. Horror is more of a black and white, like emotional response to a present and seen fear. So a couple examples. So terror would be like a bell ringing in a graveyard, or it would be that letter you receive in the mail and it has that handwriting on the outside that you recognize and it just strikes in you this terrible, terrible dread. Horror, on the other hand, is more like the response you have when your car is careening off of a cliff, or you are faced with a great white shark in the middle of the ocean, something like that. So that's horror. So think of terror. Terror dwells in the shadows and horror is more black and white. You can also think of terror as being very closely related to the psychological and spiritual and emotional state of the characters that you're writing, whereas horror is going to be a more universal response. So nobody opens the door at 2 a.m. to a guy in a hockey mask with a chainsaw and thinks, well, I wish I had baked something earlier so that I'd be a more hospitable host. The fact of the matter is that that scenario strikes a virtually universal response in everyone. But if you look back to the examples we used earlier, for example, that handwriting on the letter, that's going to be very, very individual to your character. It's going to be very specific to that person's internal unresolved anxiety or unresolved emotional or spiritual questions, whereas horror is going to be more cut and dry. So in the gothic genre, what we see historically is virtually 100% use of terror instead of horror. And that's for obvious reasons. If you've watched my video, What is Gothic Lit? We talked a lot about gothic themes and how gothic deals with the irrational. So essentially gothic is dealing with those themes of spiritual or psychological or emotional things that can't be proven through the five senses. And so terror, because terror deals with the unseen and it deals with those things that kind of lurk in the shadows where we can't, we can't really put our finger on what's actually lurking over there, the terror parallels that in internal theme a whole lot better than horror does on whole. However, if you look at the market these days, you've probably noticed that there are some books now that are bridging the gap between gothic and horror. So they are employing both. And there is a place for that. I do believe that you can use horror in gothic. But the question is when? So when would it make sense to use one versus the other? So I think the best way to look at this is to talk about two specific examples. One that features terror and one that features horror. So for terror, I have chosen Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. My very old and very well-loved version of this. I've read it a gazillion times. So what is going on in Jane Eyre? Well, 
Jane grew up in a very abusive household as a child. She lived with her aunt and her cousins, and they didn't want her there. They treated her like a slave to be used and abused. And so she grew very bitter and angry, and then she goes away to boarding school. While she's at boarding school, she meets this girl, Helen Burns. Now, Helen is like a paragon of virtue. She's so sweet, lovably sweet, that it's pretty clear that no one, very few people like this would actually genuinely exist, but Helen's someone that we still end up loving in the story. So she is one of those people who just never responds out of anger. She's never bitter. She always looks at the best side of everything. And she is the person who really shows Jane the first glimpse of what it can mean to love people selflessly. So this is one of the dominant things that's happening in Jane Eyre, and there are some other things that are definitely happening there as well. But Jane has come to this place, to this school, with this mentality of bitterness and the idea that she has to guard herself and be very careful because people will constantly use her and abuse her. And then she sees Helen. And that is a that is a very new thing for Jane because it's it would have been in the past it would have been extraordinarily dangerous for her to have had that mentality because of her family situation. And then what happens? So she moves on and she meets Mr. Rochester. And she falls in love with him course if you know the story you know it well something goes wrong and she ends up running away one of my very favorite elements of Jane Eyre is that when she's finally free to marry Mr. Rochester at the end when his wife is no longer alive he is incapacitated from the fire and so he's able to love Jane with his whole heart, but he has this constant physical needs. Like he needs a caretaker, but Jane has learned enough by that point that she is able to love him wholeheartedly and selflessly with no fear of losing herself or not being loved in return. So that is kind of a synopsis of what's going on in Jane Eyre. So... What does the author use? Well, Charlotte Bronte uses almost entirely terror, not horror. And it makes sense that she uses terror in this book because Jane's theme that she is learning is very, very individualized and localized to herself. Yes, we can apply it to ourselves as well. Really in the book, Ms. Bronte is talking about very specific characters journey to overcome her past so that she can love freely. So terror, because it deals with the unseen and because it deals with those things that are very highly individualized and, um, specific to a given character, terror parallels Jane's journey better than horror would. In contrast, I have a really good example of something that actually is not marketed as gothic, but I believe this is in fact a gothic book. It is horror as well. I would call this gothic horror. It is Carrie and Comfort by Dan Simmons. I am a huge fan of Dan Simmons. His writing is extraordinarily brilliant and brilliant in the way that in such a way that it's actually a, also a compelling and quick read. In Dan Simmons books, you get the best of both worlds. You get the quality of a really phenomenal literary fiction and yet you get the really strong plot lines of a genre fiction. So uh, Carrie and Comfort is no exception, but it is definitely horror. So in this book, Dan is dealing with a theme that's extraordinarily thought-provoking. He is examining the tendency that a lot of humans have, possibly many humans have, to want to subjugate other people's wills to their own. So essentially to want to take over them and control them in some way. He takes this to extremes because because it is a gothic horror book. Um, he uses something he calls mind vampires. So they aren't actually acting like traditional vampires would. Instead, these mind vampires essentially enter into the minds and wills of other people and force them to do whatever these mind vampires want. 
And um, the main character starts out in a concentration camp in Poland. But this main character, he's on this journey to find this Nazi, I think he's a general, Nazi general, who was a mind vampire. And when he had encountered this person, it just threw him over how much this man was able to control himself, to control the main character, and to control others around him. This type of theme is, it's specific to the main character, but it's much more universal in the sense that what um, Dan Simmons is doing is he's asking the question, how can certain people compel so many other people to do what they want? especially in the case of things like World War II, which he uses as a backdrop, in which a few extraordinarily evil people were able to talk so many others into killing millions of their fellow humans. So it's a very thought-provoking question, and it has a very universal application. So in that case, horror makes a whole lot more sense, and that's exactly what he uses from start to finish. So... Um, in summary, I would say when you're dealing with very, very individual themes, when you're dealing with a theme that is so specific to the character that it's um, dealing with their internal psychological, spiritual, emotional state or past fears and past associations, stick with terror. If you're dealing with a theme that's really asking a question about something much larger, um, something that's much more universal, like the state of humanity or um, the f a fact, a specific spiritual question or something, horror might be a better way to go. And um, one thing I will clarify and add on the back of that is that sometimes when you're dealing with something that might seem like one or the other, the question to ask is how do you want to address it as a writer? So for instance, if you look at Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles, especially the first two books, Interview with the Vampire and the Vampire Lestat, you have these vampires and yes, they are technically feeding off of people and killing them. But if you look at the theme she's dealing with, she's dealing a lot with redemption. She's dealing a lot with Louis' inability to find his identity now that he's a vampire and his inability to uncover like who he is and what he is and how can he reconcile himself with that. Because she deals with the theme at such a very personal and localized level, she uses almost exclusively terror instead of horror. So, so all that to say, sometimes when you're dealing with a book in which you could go either way, the question is how do you want to deal with the theme? Do you want to deal with it in a very specific local way or do you want to deal with it on a much grander universal way? And that might help you determine which way to go. So that's it for today. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and don't forget to ring that bell so that you'll be alerted every time I release a new video. I post videos on Friday. Until next time, stay undead, my friends.